So welcome to No Reserve with my old friend Gary Simmons. It's a delight to be here at Hausenworth in LA with this monumental show that's a bit of a retrospective in some ways of techniques. I'm, I'm curious, knowing you almost 35 years in your work, it's like this sort of reemergence, not that you were ever off the picture with all those years with Metro Pictures, but changing to a different setting sort of as a reset button in an interesting way. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm in the middle of, of uh, putting together a, a survey show. And through putting that work together, um, it's, it's been an interesting path to, to kind of uncover things that you haven't, you know, finished conversations with. And over the years, you kind of develop your own visual language that you get sort of comfortable and, and use, and, and you can start to, to play with old and new and, you know, bringing newer pieces in and, and things like that. So there's a kind of exchange a little bit with um, older techniques and newer techniques. And because of the climate that we're in um, and different events that have taken place, I think a lot of those things have found their way into the conversation again. There are pieces that are brought out that I maybe did, you know, maybe 30 years ago. Uh, you know, I think a lot of these issues are, you know, over time just don't go away. And I think that's kind of, at the, at the base, that's kind of what the work's about. You know, it's, you're attempting to erase a stereotype that can never really truly go away. Well, there's this history in these, in these wall drawings that is really about cultural history. So that bridge of sort of like appropriation, cultural history, into these issues about, you know, race in America largely, yeah. into what it mean to be doing that in 2022. I mean, what's it mean to be doing that today? These things are still relevant now as they were back then, and they have a new application as uh, newer things pop up politically or, or otherwise. And, uh, you know, I think that at the core, to be perfectly honest, the work, as you know, comes from education and where we learn those visual stereotypes and the way we fit into certain kinds of uh, 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 histories. Like well, we were talking before, we both have 15-year-old daughters born almost, you know, within a month of each other, and we used to live around the corner from each other. Yeah. And, like, how has her looking at your work evolved? I don't know, what is her relationship to it and how you're raising a child with all these issues, having these issues in your work, has that affected you in some way besides being like Yeah, I think that, um, you know, I think from the time she was born, I think, and she could walk and talk, I think the idea of being critical and using your critical voice um, to think about context, to think about uh, consequences and every action has a consequence from the very young age has, uh, you know, sort of plugged them in. And I think I, I would have to say it's not just isolated to my own uh, child's experience. I think that that generation um, is remarkable. I think that they're, they're actually doing and are active in uh, what they're saying. They're putting action behind what they're saying, the, you know, which which is saying something, and I think they're, you know, they're pissed off. They're, they're talking about climate, they're talking about race, they're talking about things that affect them on a global scale that I don't think generations prior to them. Well, I'm a, I'm a generation racist. older than you, yep. so growing up in the protests of Vietnam and the civil rights movement, and my mom campaigned for the Black Panthers, and I'm marching in the street, there was a big gap there after that where the sort of Gen X millennials sort of got like, the world is fucked, you've messed it up with, for us, we, you know, it sucks, we're not doing anything. And then I see the generation of our kids saying, well, shit, we're gonna lean in yeah. and try to do something about, because they're afraid of being killed at school. Sure, and they're not just throwing their hands up and saying, well, you fucked it up. You know, they're, they're like, you fucked it up, yeah. And they're very quick to tell you that you fucked it up. But they're active and proactive in trying to, to, to find solutions in, in different corners of, of 
of the. Of, and does that make uh, you, as an artist, more optimistic about yeah. how your work can speak to another generation and another audience? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I think that's that goes into trying to put together an exhibition like this, which covers, um, like you said, probably close to 30, 35 years of work. That you know, that I'm not uh, arrogant enough to believe that every generation since I've made that work is familiar with what I do. And so this show is probably a cross cut of a lot of areas that I've touched on in some way. There's, for me, moving from having multiple galleries into a gallery like Hauser and Worth has really kind of stepped up my practice and my game in, in, in a lot of different ways. And Such as? I think that I'm able to focus more because I, I can only, um, there's, there's one avenue or source that I need to, to filter the work to. Whereas when you have multiple galleries, you have to satisfy a lot of the pull and the needs of, of, of different people. It's very much like having a, a step parents or something. So it's, uh, you know, the idea of having one show per year allows me to focus in on ideas and be really uh, settled into, into that. Uh, but also, you, you had sort of a, a two-sided sword thing. I mean, you've always been successful and critically successful. On the other hand, I would always, for the last 20 years, people say, well, whose work's undervalued? I go, Gary Simmons. And you go to the auction, it's like four to 10 million. You go 20 to $30,000. It's like WTF. And you're probably saying that a little bit too because your normal person, and now there may be this opportunity of like being a rediscovered artist who was never forgotten. Mm -hmm. It's not like you're Ed Clark or somebody that no one was paying attention to right. because, or Sam Gilliam or even Jack Whitten, you know. You were on the forefront, you've been your whole career there, but now it's a, it's like, feels like an overnight sensation from 30 years of hard work <laughs> and never having been out of, you know, off the playlist. It's, uh, Does that make sense what I'm saying? It's, yeah, I, I think a little bit. I, you know, uh, I, don't, I try not to pay too much attention to auction houses because I think that numbers go up and come down and, and um, you know, what's hip today is gone tomorrow and, and all of that. So if you pay too much attention to that, but it's hard to, for it to be such a center of conversation without listening to some of the noise. Um, you try to shut it out. You know, I, I look to people like Jack Whitten. I, I look at somebody like a Bob Gober that, you know, Bob just chugs along on his own track doing his thing. And that's kind of, those are some of the artists that I kind of model well, I myself think after. It's interesting in that sense is no matter what would have happened to Bob's career, he'd be making art today. Yeah, 100%. You'd be making art today. Yeah, there's no doubt. I don't think the market drives um, those artists to make their work and, and like you said I think that they'd be making work whether they had these you know financially successful careers or not <laughs>